you are interested in shooting stock, you've got some ideas, but obviously there are technical requirements that you need to meet. Now, fortunately, this process isn't that difficult. Adobe works with a lot of different formats, but let's talk about what we need to do to get a clip ready. First from the shooting side, and then we'll talk about the actual compression and upload and submission. So if I'm gonna go out there and shoot, are there any limitations to what type of camera I should or shouldn't use? No, really not. The only thing that we accept is HD and above, right? And most people, again, are shooting 4K. But as you said, codec is, uh, there's, there's a variety of different choices that we can accept. Uh, and then there's some other technical specs in terms of length and everything, but cameras, it's, technology is great. Okay. And we can, we can accept a lot of different camera forms. Now, I know a lot of folks will invest in higher end digital cinema cameras. If the camera has better technical ability and you know how to use that technical ability, there's probably an appreciation for a digital cinema camera with shallow depth of field that's shot and well lit. But if something is shot on someone's smartphone from travel photography, as long as perhaps they maybe actually use a tripod and stabilize it, it can still do pretty well, right? Right, it really comes down to the aesthetic and matching like what the customer needs. You know, early when I came in and I was like, wow, I'd look at some of the, the clips in our library, which was much smaller than it is today. And I go like, wow, that's, that's not really a very good clip. Mm -hmm. But a friend of mine would show me, he's like, yeah, but it sold 10 times. Right. You know, so a lot of times it comes back to the composition. What is the subject matter? What does the customer need? And if you're shooting the content that those people need, uh, it's the, the, the technical execution is always a plus in the best, you know, two shots, mm -hmm. a good one on an, on an iPhone or a phone or an average camera versus an extremely well lit in a digital cinema camera. Sure, that one will win out, but there's room for both. Subject wins. Now, tripods and stabilizing the shot is pretty important. Now, I know that obviously you guys have shots with movement, sliders, gimbals, sure. all that stuff is great. Yeah. But if you are newer to the world of video, just getting a rock solid shot and locked off will still sell, right? Absolutely. So again, it's subject matter. You know, some like you said, some shots will require movement. Sometimes the the subtle camera movement can really be helpful to the, the composition of the shot. But you know, hey, I'm on an iPhone or or a very inexpensive camera. I can just take a sandbag or a rock sack or whatever, set it on there, and get a steady shot. I'm good to go. Now you mentioned that there are some requirements for length. I think a lot of times when people are shooting. Um, people move at a quick space, you know, even traditional video shooters, I often have to remind them, the editor wants handles. They need, you know, they might want a 15 second clip. You might think it's getting boring, but they might want what happens later. What are the time durations that you guys request? What's the minimum? What's the maximum? And what do you think is a good sort of in between? Yeah, great question. Um, technically, we'll go even below five seconds and 60 seconds is really the ceiling. 60 seconds, you know, there's got to be a compelling reason in that shot. Again, I would kind of go back and say, is that, is the shot telling some kind of story that's germane that makes it worthwhile to get it all the way up to 60 seconds? So 60 if, it's a, seconds. if it's a locked off shot of the ocean and waves coming in after about 20 seconds, you're probably good, right? Yeah, okay. exactly, right. <laughs> so, um, and then, uh, but we'll accept content that's even less than five seconds, uh, which is a, a recent change. Um, Typically, though, I think the clips that sell the most are going to average somewhere between 15 and 30 seconds, and I think between 15, maybe a few seconds less than that, to up to 20, is probably the spot that where we see the most uh, traffic. Because this gives people the ability to either use this in social advertisements. You see a lot of individual single video clips being used on Facebook for ads sure. these days. And that's become very popular. Like, hey, if a photo sells and gets people's attention in a timeline, imagine what a video clip with some text right. over it does, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing designers do this because tools like Photoshop can actually open up video clips and they can just put text over it and make a video ad and use stock video for that. So I think having a little bit longer is probably helpful there, right, for the social ads? Yeah, absolutely. It all depends. I think in the social ads and web kind of web deliverables, the, the trade-off there is do we, does the person know how to encode it down to a, a size that will not slow the web page down? Right. But you're absolutely right. Again, it's up to the customer. Uh, I think when you're giving like 20 or even 30 seconds, which is probably on the, on the high end of the average, what you will find is that, like you said, they have plenty of handles. Maybe they only need five seconds, but they have a lot of room to find the very best five seconds. Maybe other people need 10, 15, 20 seconds. It's all up to them. So it's again, think about like one of the primary principles that I'd love to, to let contributors and 
uh, you know, p potential contributors know is like, think like your customer. Okay. And they're going to also want these clips to be color corrected already, remove any of the slop at the beginning of the end, like if there's a slate or if the camera's stabilizing or you're calling action. They just want the good parts, right? Right. Yeah. Ready to use? I've, we do not do a lot of camera raw right now today. So I get some guys that say, hey, should I let my, should I leave my, you know, really high end clip? Uh, like in a ProRes format, fairly flat. And I'm like, no, you know, kind of just give it a little S curve, put a little, you know, curves in there to, to pull the blacks and the whites a little bit, but just leave a latitude for a real editor that might want to give it a little more push, you know, push it color-wise one way or the other. But yeah, basically give it basic color correction, give the handles, get rid of the slop, don't leave the slate in and things like that, but give enough handles and I think you're good to go. It's really not that difficult. Now, if you are on the other side creating this content, uh, you know, let's first talk about Photoshop. So a photographer could open up a lot of camera files right into Photoshop. They can trim it and they've got basic color correction. They can export out of that, right? Like they just pick a high quality preset and they can make clips for upload? Out of Photoshop? Yeah. For sure, yeah. I mean, you're ultimately going through Adobe Media Encoder and you, you, if you're comfortable with curves and levels and adjustment layers inside of Photoshop, if you want to do that, absolutely. But if you start to do a lot of this, I think the investment in adding Adobe Premiere Pro to your workflow really comes in because it's going to be a lot faster. And you have some integration built into Premiere to make it easier to upload right from the project, right? So you can do a lot of clips and just yeah. push them up at once. Yeah. So I think for me, I'm definitely a Premiere guy. Like, can I do a clip in Photoshop and export it? Yes. But um, my, my tool of choice is going to be Premiere. Uh, for a couple of reasons, right? Like you said, marking ins and outs, trimming that slop on either side is going to be a lot easier and faster. Um, and then the color tools, you know, obviously Lumetri is a great coloring engine. Uh, it's very fast, it's very quick. So if you just want to, I've actually myself done, like go into Lumetri and hit the auto just to kind of get, get it in the range and I can tweak it. And that just speeds me along and gives me, you know, all the kind of latitude that I need. And then, like you said, one of the things that we did at NAB in 2017 was add a publish to Adobe stock out, out of Premiere Pro so I can take my clips, uh, do the work that I need to them, and then I'm making, you know, for example, like a high quality H.264 as an output, and then I check the box with Adobe Stock. I've logged in, got my credentials, and it automatically FTPs it up to the contributor stock site. So I don't have to know exactly what format to make. I don't have to put them all in a folder and then make them and then upload them. I could just literally make a bin, subclip out the good stuff I want, or mark ins and outs, yeah. and just say, take all of this and put it there. Yeah, it's really that easy. <laughs> Which is good, right? Right, exactly. We, we don't want to make it hard. <laughs> good. All right. Now, we've talked a bit about how to color grade this footage and, you know, HD versus 4K. Are there any other technical specs to be aware of? There's a lot of different flavors of 4K out there. There's a lot of different frame rates out there. Sure. What are you guys looking for? Again, there's an opportunity for all different kinds. Uh, so you can go down to 23,976 or 24 frames. You can go up to 5994, uh, even greater than that. Um, from a frame size, obviously we're only accepting 1080 as a minimum. And again, most shooters I think that have a modern camera should shoot 4K, a 4K flavor. What's nice about that, by the way, is that when you submit, you don't have to upload the 4K and an HD version. No, just give us the highest one. Okay. And what we'll do is we'll automatically make a 1920 by 1080 version for you. So you have two products. Some people are going to want 4K, other ones are only going to want the, the 1080 version, right? So you kind of do the automatic down converts. Right, we want to make this as service friendly for you as possible, right? You take the time to shoot the content, to make the content, to keyword the content, the rest of it's on us. Now, what am I uploading? Which preset am I picking inside of Premiere Pro or Adobe Media Encoder, or is that handled for me? Uh, obviously, we might not be shooting in H.264, but you guys are delivering H.264 files to the customer, right? There's a couple of different things that you can be doing. You could be uploading ProRes. There's a variety of different flavors that are up there. But um, when I talk about uh, s some countries and different places around the world have more challenges in terms of bandwidth uploads, so H.264 actually performs really well. Customers, uh, for the most part, are very comfortable with that. So, and it saves a tremendous amount of space, both in terms of upload, storage costs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then coming back in terms of, it's not just frame rates going from 24 up to, you know, 
160 or 120, but also frame sizes. So we, we support both a DCI 4K as well as a UHD and a couple of other flavors as well. Great, and can customers search on that criteria if they yeah. need to? Great, right. so this, because Adobe's pretty strong in the broadcast market, and so a lot of broadcasters or folks working in a specific industry can actually take their very technical specs and then limit their searches to that, right? Right, absolutely, yeah. And we want to make it, again, easy for everyone to be able to find the content that they want and have the kind of filtering options that people can, can find the exact clip with the right specs. Well, any other technical things that people should know about? We'll talk more about keywording a little bit later, which is part of the sales process. But anything else that people should know about with those clips? Any do's or don'ts that you've seen? You know, why do video clips sometimes get rejected? Are there any technical reasons? Sure, there are going to be some technical reasons, and we try and give as much feedback as we can, realizing we have moderation teams that look at every single clip and image that comes into Adobe Stock, and we get millions, right? So yeah, you guys are picky because you, by having the library be high quality, it increases the confidence of the consumer to use it. Absolutely, the, you know, the idea is that if we reject a clip of yours, it's not a personal thing, you shouldn't take it personally or be upset or, or say Adobe's terrible. No, you know, when your good, your good clips make it and they make it on to the, the stock site, there's that consistency and quality in the Adobe brand name trust that generates and works for you to create more sales for you. So typical reasons where things, and, and look, I'm, I'm the most middling average uh, uh, videographer slash cinematographer I've ever known. Uh, so I get lots of rejections. So, you know, maybe my focus, where I put my focus wasn't just quite the right thing, or maybe it's a little softer, maybe the camera I'm using today is a little bit older. Uh, obviously things like that can be a big issue. And they're okay with shallow depth of field, but oh, the yeah. subject matter needs to be clearly in focus. Right, so uh, there could also be a lack of aesthetic things. So, you know, I ha happen to love macro photography and it's just fascinating for me, but it's not necessarily as commercially viable. So make sure, again, you're shooting content that is uh, commercially interesting and has an aesthetic. But things like out of focus, uh, noise could be another problem. Again, with older cameras, you know, we're, we're looking for that and we want to make sure, again, that the quality of the collection is super high. And if I want to see what is selling well, I could do a search for some keywords or topics that I'm interested in and then sort the results by best selling? Yeah, so that's where it's a little bit different. So we have two sites that content is sold today, okay. which is one is Adobe Stock and then the company that we purchased is called Fotolia. So there is, you can search, when you do a search inside of Adobe Stock, you can search by best-selling, uh, undiscovered, mm -hmm. recent, et cetera. If you go to Fotoli, you can do much the same thing. Okay, and having this ability to sort of search will help you see undiscovered might give you some ideas of things that aren't really cluttered but are starting to rise up in search and then right. popular is going to help you see what's selling and you can sort of benchmark, right? Like, oh, I see what this is doing well here. Yeah, absolutely. Now that makes a lot of sense. In our next episode, what we're going to focus on are some of the do's and don'ts from a legal point of view. What sort of release forms do you need so you have the rights to sell content? And are there any subject matters or things like brands that we need to be careful of to make sure that we don't have any rights issues when trying to monetize our footage?